these offerings and these tithes that represent faith and trust in you. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would open up your windows of heaven and pour out blessings that can't be contained, that you would rebuke the devourer, Lord, for uh, people's sake, and that you would bless them, release blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Lord, as we turn to your word, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the fullness of what you would have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Okay, so to start this morning, I'm going to tell you about the worst Christmas of my life. It wasn't this one. Close. It wasn't this one. I was 10. My sister was eight. And we had asked for all kinds of different gifts for Christmas. And on Christmas morning, of course, uh, we wake up when all kids do, 545. And, you know, wake our parents up and, you know, we, we, we're forced to drink orange juice and eat toast. And once we gag that down, we run to the Christmas tree. And everything I had asked for was there. I asked for a set of Rock'em Sock'em robots, I got one. I wanted a G.I. Joe, I got one. I wanted it with a little inflatable raft from the Neilon and Paddle, I got one. My sister got some stupid thing that she asked for. Um, and it was thrilling, it was awesome. You know, back then, Christmas trees actually smelled, right? Now they either stink or they have no scent. I don't know what, what's happened to the Christmas trees. But anyway, it smelled like Christmas, you know, and, and, and I was playing with my toy, and Lynn was playing with her silly thing, until my dad asked, what did you get us? My sister and I had both forgotten to get my parents a gift. I will never forget the feeling of my heart dropping through into my bowels. I cried so hard that day because I just could not believe how inconsiderate and stupid I was. There I was at 10 years of age. My life had been ruined by folly and narciss narcissism. And I just, you know, I, I, just, I just hated myself. To this day, I cringe when I think about that Christmas. Gifts. How important are gifts and, 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 and what do gifts say about who we are and who the person is that we're giving a gift to? There are, from what I can see in Scripture, three things that make a gift, when you give it to somebody, important. Number one... It's actually a combination of two things. It's time and effort. Time and effort. If you look in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 29, Jacob is in love with a girl named Rachel. He sees her and she makes his heart go pitter-pat. He wants to be married to her. It's a real blessing to Rachel that she has been found uh, by, by, by somebody uh, who, who, who wants to be with her. But her, Rachel's father, Laban, makes Jacob work for seven years in order to have her as his wife. And it says in Genesis chapter 29, verse 18, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll, wait, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel, uh, Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But look at this. But they seemed like only a few days to him. Why? Because of his love for her. Because Jacob loved Rachel so much, he worked for her to be able to marry her for seven years. But to him, it only seemed like nothing. Because of his love for her. Some gifts take a great deal of time. You know, for instance, Matt, sometimes he gives uh, coffee to, to people as a Christmas gift. It takes time to roast this stuff. I mean, every single Sunday morning, he shows up with these bags. It takes time. He has to order the coffee, which means he has to go on the computer. He has to peruse all the coffees of the world, select the one that he thinks would be best for the people of this church, you the people that he loves, 
He has to have it shipped to his house, which he pays for. He has to roast it. He has to research, is it supposed to be city, city plus, full city, full city plus? You know, what, what's the best roasting uh, darkness for this coffee that makes this flavor bloom or that flavor bloom? He has to make sure he roasts it on time. He can't roast it too far ahead of time because if he does, then all acids go flat and all the oils go flat. And usually he's roasting on Saturday to make sure you get something that was roasted just the day ahead. All that takes time. But... The time seems like nothing to him because he loves Jesus and because he loves you. It is a display. Sometimes when you look at a cup of coffee, it's like, it's nothing, right? But if you come to understand what it takes to make that cup and to provide those stupid little brown bags back there of that fresh coffee, you come to understand the depth of how Matt Casamina feels about you, feels about the Lord, and feels about this church. Time is a reflection of what a gift means. And it bleeds into the second aspect of the first parameter. Effort. What you have to do to put into, to, to, to produce that. For instance, even if I gave you green coffee, how many of you would be able to roast it perfectly and, and make it like Matt does? He has to go online, he has to research, he has to study, he has to find out how to do this. If he realizes, I want to provide the people at CCI with fresh roasted coffee that I make myself, he has to study, he has to read, he watches these crazy videos. What's this show called? This guy goes off and does stuff? Perfect Grind or something like that? Just go with it. If you nod, they won't know, okay, because they don't watch it. But anyway, he has to learn how to do this stuff. He has to find out what, and all that research takes not only time, but takes effort. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, Jesus is talking about when he is going to come and return to this earth. How many of you guys are looking forward to Jesus returning? Say amen. He talks about what it's going to be like during that, those days. He says in Matthew 25, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is not the kingdom of God now, it's the kingdom of heaven kingdom of heaven. So this has to do with salvation. By the way, anytime it talks about the kingdom of God, it is talking about the, 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 the sovereignty of God as it is manifest here on earth now. When it says you, Marcella, can enter into the kingdom of God, what it means is when you make Jesus your king in your mind and in your heart, let him rule your emotions, let him rule your mind, and, and turn your life over to him this way. He becomes king, and now the kingdom of God wakes up and is manifest in you. And now the kingdom of God rules. It's kind of like a, it's, it's like an embassy. You know, if you go to an embassy, you know, uh, on that ground, on that dirt, that's actually Filipino soil. That's actually Samoan soil. That's actually German soil. Whatever is that designated as an embassy, that belongs to that country. In that way, when you make Jesus king of your heart and your mind, your body and your life now becomes the kingdom. And where the kingdom rule, where the God is king, his kingdom rules apply. For instance, if you're at the German embassy, it is the laws of Germany that apply on that ground. Not the laws of the, not American law, but German law, or Filipino law, or Korean law applies on that ground because it's an embassy. In like manner, when Jesus is king in our heart and mind, and we say, okay, Lord, I want you to be be my king and be my Lord, and, and, I, and I give myself and my life to you. That's when the kingdom of God manifests, which is why Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not here or there. It's not a place you can go to. The kingdom of God is something that you cause to appear and emerge as you devote yourself to the Lord. And all that kingdom power and all those blessings, they manifest. Now, the kingdom of heaven is different. The kingdom of heaven has to do with where we go when we die. Antinomy is in the kingdom of heaven. So this has to do with salvation. It's not the same thing as the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish. The Greek word for foolish is moros. Uh, foolish. Okay, Wednesday, who can read that? Oh, we haven't done row yet, sorry. 
More. More. Moros. Moros. That's where we get the word moron. Basically, Jesus is saying five of them were morons. And five of them were prudent. We're going to talk about what prudent means in a minute. And when the foolish ones took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Now, this is very important to understand. How much oil did they take with them? Zero. They took no oil with them. They took no oil. There were five morons and five prudent ones. And the morons, they took no oil with them. The prudent ones took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all those virgins rose, trimmed their lamps. The word trim is cosmeo. That's where we get the word cosmetic. It means to make them ready and prepare them in, in, in terms of looks and everything. Uh, 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 their lamps and the morons, the foolish ones, said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Saben uh, umi uh, uh, is the Greek word for that. It means extinguishing. They won't light. It's not that they did light and now they're going out. It means that they won't light, basically, because there's no fuel. All you can do is burn the wick, but... If there's no oil in the lamp to draw up and actually burn, the lamp's not going to light. So they say, give us some of your oil. And basically, the other virgins, the smart ones, the prudent ones say, we can't, you have to go get it for yourself. And the bridegroom passes them because they have no oil. Now, I have heard pastors and preachers trash this passage mercilessly. In an attempt to get congregations to do this or do that, what they'll try to convince you of is the oil is how much devotion you have to Jesus. I've heard one pastor say the oil represents how much money you give to Jesus. And if you give to this ministry, then your, your lamp shall be filled with oil. But if you don't give to this ministry, why then your lamp, you're one of the foolish ones. All of that does not match. Oil is the uh, is the analogy of the holy spirit and the bible says when we accept jesus as our lord and savior who believes that jesus christ is lord say amen, amen. who believed he died and rose again three days later say amen. amen you are saved because of that belief according to what the bible says you now have the holy spirit of god living in you you are filled with the holy spirit you have your oil there are those people who claim to be religious claim to know god and claim to believe God, and claim that they're going to go someplace good because they're good people. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you do not have the Holy Spirit in you, and when the bridegroom comes back, are, are those people going to go? Much as we would like to think they are not, the Bible says they won't, because what God's looking for is the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So what this illustration is talking about is there are people who are religious, who will look like they are supposed to be Christians, or supposed to look like... They are, they, are, they are good people, but because there is no oil in them, there is no Holy Spirit, because they do not believe in the only begotten Son of God. Bridegroom comes, they stay. But here's the thing I'm trying to point out. Effort. The word prudent means... Oh, that's right. Phronomos. It means to tactically think ahead, to be strategic. If you're a chess player, you know exactly what I mean. You don't react to your opponent if you understand basic chess moves. You actually make your opponent do what you want them to, and you trap them. You make them fall into your trap. That's prudent. That's strategic. That's tactical. What Jesus is saying is there were, there were five morons and there were five tactical ones, ones that thought ahead, ones that planned ahead. If God is coming back, if Jesus is coming back, I need to be ready and I need to have my life in order and I want to have faith in Christ. In like manner, effort plays a part in a gift. Again, going back to Matthew, he has to do all this stuff ahead of time. When you get a gift, do not just simply look at it for what the, in, what, what the thing is. I got some gifts from Patty this year. 
that I could tell she thought of me months ago. And she had to be planning it for months because this is not something that she could have just ordered from Amazon.com on Thursday, have it arrive on Saturday and give it to me on Tuesday. It wouldn't work like that. Some of the things that she gave me had to be constructed and some of the things she gave me had to be put together. Your mother gave me a, a, a box, Josh, that took hours and hours and hours to make. It's covered with shells and uh, there's a little cigar label emblem on the front of it. Not really one that I smoked, but nonetheless, you know. But I could tell it took hours. There's something about not only time, but also effort and seeing that somebody thought ahead and so was anticipating giving this gift for a long time that reflects how the giver feels about the recipient. It also shows something about how the giver feels about the recipient if they receive a gift or are given a gift that shows no time, that shows no effort, that reveals you thought about giving this gift on Monday night right around the 7-Eleven or whatever the heck they had on the stand in some, in some sort of plastic bag. That's what you wound up giving. That also reveals how you feel about a person. Okay, time and effort, number two. I need to move on, I'm running out of time. Two, value. Value, this is sort of like finding the perfect gift. Value has to do with value not in a uh, worldly sense, i.e., how much is this worth? For instance, somebody gave me this book, okay? A friend of mine, Don Godwin, gave me this book. Now, Value, to me, in regards to this book, has nothing to do with how much this book costs. I, 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 frankly, I know. 1995, it's right here on the back. But Don knows that I'm a theologian. Don knows that the kinds of coins they use back in the New Testament and Old Testament matter to me. I preach messages, and in order for me to be able to share some of these things with other people, I would need a study help like this. And so he specifically bought this. What this shows me is Don knows me. Don knows my life. He has spent time thinking about me. And he's not just buying me something that would be pretty or, or, or would be cool. He's actually putting thought into it so he gives me something that he knows I would really, really need and could really, really use. That's what gives that book to me more value. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed. Give them the things which are needed. Say that with me. Give them the things that are needed. One more time. Give them the things that are needed. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself if it has not works, it's dead. In other words, what the Bible is saying here is this. When we give people things, we want to think about them. We want to know something about their life. The more we know about them, the more we show we care about them, and the, the more we can reflect in the gift that we give them, that we know this is something they really need. Now, in some people's case, what, I, what they really need is money. For them, that's a great gift. Some people really need a new purse. That's a really great gift. Or some kind of tool. That's a really great gift. Or some theological book. That's a really great gift. But number one, time and effort. Number two, value. And number three, finally, cost. Cost is a, re is a reflection of value but this is a relative term, okay? If certain people give me a gift that costs five dollars, you know, I know they haven't thought about me very much. Some of you give me a gift for five, five dollars, I would know you had to do without a meal. You had to skip lunch and possibly dinner on a certain day 
in order to purchase for me what you got for me. When I look at a gift that is given to me, I think about all these things. I think about the time it took for the person to procure it, the effort they had to go through in order to get it, the value and how it reflects how they know me and the fact that they know me shows they're interested in me. They want to know me and they want to know my life and they want to give something that accommodates those needs and those desires that I have. And cost, it's relative. But cost is something that's important when it comes to a gift. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, David is blessed by God, so he wants to build an altar for him in a field so that he can offer sacrifices. And Aruna, the king of that, uh, that precinct, says, you know, your majesty, you're going to give the Lord a sacrifice. Hey, you know, take this land. You know what David says to him? I will not. I will pay you full price for this land because I will not give and offer to God something that costs me nothing. I want to make sure David, the man after God's own heart, realizes something about the nature of gifts and realizes that if I'm going to give God a sacrifice, I can't give Him something that doesn't cost me anything, that has no value and reflects no time or effort. I want to make sure in what I offer God and give God, I represent. Somebody say represent. I represent how I love Him and how I believe in Him, how I feel about Him, and how grateful to Him I am. That's the purpose of the gift. Now, in terms of cost, in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, it says this. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins. Mites is what the King James refers to them as worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in, anybody know what he said? More than all the rest. In fact, you need to understand, the, when he says put in uh, into the treasury, more than all the others, that all the others is panta, that's a genitive plural clause. What that means is it's not that she put in more than this guy, or put in more than that lady, or put in more than that lady, put in, put in more than this guy. What it means is, Panta, it's a genitive, plural, inclusive. You add up everything that everybody gave. And in the end, this lady gave more than all of them put together. Fascinating to me. Since Jesus is the Word made flesh, and He's actually the one they're giving their offerings to. So if anybody would be qualified to judge who gave what, it would be him, the recipient of the offering. And he said, that woman, she gave more than everybody else put together. Why? Because everybody else gave out of their plusery, their, every, uh, out of their abundance. She gave everything she had to live on. She trusted the blessing of God more than the money in the hand. This is the test of faith, by the way, for all of us when we consider tithing. Now, tithing, that's just 10%. Everything you get, 10% goes to the Lord. One place, the storehouse. Spiritual rule, not a, not a part of the Old Testament, although it was incorporated in the Old Testament. It's actually a spiritual rule. It's kind of like, uh, as you give, so you shall receive. Is that part of the Old Testament law? No. That's just a spiritual law. That's the way God has decided things are going to go. God's also decided when you give and surrender 10% to Him, He's going to bless you and protect you and do all this great stuff. And here's where the test of faith comes, Shalai, okay? Do you believe financially you're better off with 100% of all the money you get without God's blessing or 90% of your money well, with God blessing it and protecting it? Second one, right? Okay, intellectually, that makes sense. But I'll tell you something. When you have rent due, when you have food you have to buy, when you have tuition you have to pay for, 
books you have to pay for, and you already don't have enough, now saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shortfall everything I've got with now 10% less, looks like a stupid choice. But this is where the rubber meets the road for the believer. Is it better to have the 90% with God's blessing or 100% and maybe God will bless, maybe not, I don't know. But his word actually says he's covenant bound not to. That scares me. Can I hear an amen? All right, this is not a sermon on tithing, by the way. It's a sermon on giving. And here's the thing. God, when he takes a look at when somebody gives, can tell that the cost represents how they feel. That's why Jesus said that widow who gave two mites. This is a mite. Okay? Years ago, uh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, given this, this mite. It's, a it's actually 2,300 years old uh, by Roy Blizzard. He's a theologian friend of mine who's a, a master in Hebraic study. And here you can pass that around, bud. Um, that's a 2,300-year-old mite. That mite was in existence when Jesus walked the earth. And that's what the widow threw in there, two of them. Okay? That's, that's this right here. Two of these are equal to one of these. This is a penny. You, can, you guys can come up here and take a look at this book after the sermon's over. Okay, but these are, these are replicas of coins that were used during that time. Here's the thing. Let me close with this. Gifts are good to give people. We're supposed to give gifts to people. And we're supposed to give gifts to God. And as we ascertain how we're going to represent our feelings and devotions for that person, think how to apply time and effort and value and cost to these things. Me, I'm a strategic gift giver. You know, uh, one of the things I gave my son this last year was uh, this, uh, this thing that he stomps on. I don't know what the heck he, he, it does, but he, he, he gets it. But I had to grab that a month and a half before Christmas. If I had gone the week of Christmas, they were out. If I had tried, if I had tried to buy it on Amazon.com that week and have it shipped, they were out. That Pod HD 500 was one of the most popular things for you know crazy you know electric music, musicians like him this season. But I have to think about it. That's what gives it value when you receive a gift from somebody. Not only as a giver think, but as a receiver think. Don't just eat breakfast in the morning and think, ooh, this is good. Don't measure the meal based on how good the Portuguese sausage is or how well the, whether the rice is done or not. Stop and think. Somebody had to cook this rice yesterday night so you would have it this morning. Somebody had to make sure there were eggs in the refrigerator so that they could be cooked today. Somebody had to make sure there was soya. Somebody had to go out and get cha siu so it could be cut up and made. All of this reflects time, it reflects effort, it reflects value, it reflects cost. And the point I'm trying to make to you this morning is this. It shows you how loved you are. Amen? Everybody get that point. Then you need to get this point. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. How does God truly feel about you? What was He willing to do for you in time and effort and value and cost to show you that He loves you? In order to have you with Him, in order to have Naomi with Him, in order to have your mother with Him, for all of eternity, He had to take His Son, His one and only Son, a third of the entire Trinity, the Word made flesh, and He had to separate Himself from that Son. So the Son could only talk to the Father while He walked on the earth and prayed. That immediate fellowship, gone, taken from Him for 33 and a half years while Jesus walked on the earth. And he had to watch his son abused. And he had to watch his son get hurt. He had to watch his son beaten by these crazy people who he loved so much, he wanted them saved. Every one of those Roman soldiers, God wants them saved. Every single one of those Pharisees, God wants them saved. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says in 1 Peter, God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. He wanted them all saved. The very ones that were beating Jesus and, 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 and piercing Jesus and pulling the beard off of his face and, and, and shouting at him 
were the ones that he wanted to save. I'm doing this to save you. So as you contemplate God, and because certain things happen in life, it seems as though maybe God doesn't care, maybe God doesn't love you, and maybe God has lost your phone number because certain things you prayed for haven't come to pass. I beg of you to remember what gives what makes a gift mean something is the time. He planned Jesus coming 4,000 years before he arrived to earth. The effort. You try living sinless for an hour. Go ahead, try it. An hour. One hour. All right, let's cut it back. Try 10 minutes. Okay, let's try it. Sinless. One, two, three, go. See, the fact that you can even think you can do it is sin. So, too bad. Okay? He did it for 33 and a half years. 33 and a half years. Lousy food. Absent from the glories of heaven. Living a servant's role for 33 and a half years so that in the end he could be horribly abused and crucified. For God so loved the world. It's funny because in John 3.16... You know, the, the, the verse that Billy Graham basically based 2,000 sermons on. It starts with the word, for God so loved Tim. For God so loved Aria. For God so loved Richard. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever, anybody, believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If there's ever a time for you to ascertain how somebody feels about you based upon a gift, using these parameters, think about God for a second and how much He loves you and what you must mean to Him in order for Him to have done that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank You and we praise You. We thank You and we praise You for Your love for us. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for your love, for those who have gone on before us, for us, for our lives, for all the time and the effort and all the value and all the cost that was invested by heaven into earth to bring man salvation. We give you thanks and we give you praise. Let us live in a way this week, God, that reflects the gratitude we truly feel. As we say no to things that you don't desire for us and embrace things that you do, let us be a gift to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clay, are we going to dance one more? Yes. All righty. Everybody give the Lord a hand. He's awesome.
promise that he brings There will be a place with no more suffering There will be a day with no more tears No more pain and no more fears There will be a day when the burdens of this pain face to face but until that day we'll hold on to you Down all alone, troubled soul, don't lose your heart. The joy and peace he brings, and the beauty that's in store. How is the hurt of life still? But I hold on to this hope and the promise that he brings. That there will be a place with no more suffering.